Frank Sinatra Fighting with Casino Executives. 35-year-old Frank Sinatra made his Las Vegas debut at the Desert Inn in 1951. Sinatra started performing and co-owning The Sands when it opened in 1952 and as of 1961 currently owns 9% of Sands. Sinatra is known to be acquainted with hoodlums of national importance, including Sam Giancana. Welcome to the Sands Hotel as Vice President in Charge of Entertainment. I hereby officially welcome you to this saloon. Sinatra is regarded as having control of the entertainment industry in Las Vegas. The FBI source indicated that when someone in Las Vegas desires entertainment, arrangements must be made through Sinatra, who negotiates for this entertainment, to his financial benefit. The FBI also learned that Sinatra was a very arrogant and domineering man and usually has his way with anyone he dealt with. On the eve of its 10th anniversary celebration in 1962, the Sands Board of Directors re-elected entertainment director Jack and Trotter as president, casino manager Carl Cohen, executive vice president, and Frank Sinatra, vice president. The three officers were unanimously voted by the board to serve for the next five years. Four years later, on Thanksgiving Day, 1966, Howard Hughes arrived in Las Vegas and began his four-year stay at the Desert Inn. He said that he was sick and tired of being a small fish in a big pond of South, Southern California. He wanted to be a big fish in the small pond of the state of Nevada. Months before moving to Las Vegas, Hughes was forced to sell his stock in TWA Airlines for more than $540 million, and his advisors told him that if he didn't spend the money, that he would have a big income tax bill. So Howard Hughes bought the Desert Inn, Frontier, Castaways, Landmark, Silver Slipper, and he bought the Sands on July 24, 1967, for about $15 million. Every time the Rat Pack played the Sands, it made Hughes climb the walls. I don't think it was so much the fact that they were members of the Mafia that enraged Hughes, but just the fact that he hated Frank Sinatra, and the feeling was mutual. In the 50s, Howard Hughes was in love with Ava Gardner. He bought her everything she didn't want or need. However, she fell in love with Frank Sinatra and married him. From that moment on, the battle lines were drawn. Hughes wanted to get rid of Sinatra at the Sands and didn't care what it cost him to lose Old Blue Eyes and the Rat Pack. Hughes decided to give Sinatra a credit limit at the casino, and Bob Mayhew, who ran Nevada operations for Howard, instructed Jack and Trotter to inform Frank. But Jack was afraid to tell Frank, and so he didn't. Sinatra lost his ownership in the Sands and Cal Neva in 1963 when the state forced him to give up his gaming license because his connection to Sam Giancana at the Cal Neva in northern Nevada. Sinatra had long enjoyed privileged status at the Sands. He was always given unlimited credit in the casino, he rarely paid off his losses, and typically kept his winnings. He was opening there for a four-week engagement on Labor Day weekend in 1967, just a few weeks after Hughes' acquisition of the hotel. The following Friday, September 8th, Sinatra was at a Baccarat table with six Apollo astronauts who had come to see his show. When he asked for a marker, Sinatra got the bad news. No more credit. With guests present, he swallowed the insult, but it gnawed at him all night. Sinatra canceled the rest of his shows that weekend and left for Los Angeles, but he returned the following day and stormed into the sands at 5 in the morning, demanding to see casino boss Carl Cohen. He threatened to kill anyone who got in his way, used vile language, and said he would beat up the telephone operators if they did not connect him with Cohen. Cohen was roused from his bed, grudgingly got dressed, and strode into Sands' garden room to meet with Sinatra. Sinatra confronted the normally mild-mannered former college boxing champion about his new credit limit. Eventually, Sinatra shoved the table onto Cohen, and the 275-pound casino executive responded with a punch that bloodied Sinatra's nose and knocked out two capped teeth. That no one came to Sinatra's aid says enough about both Cohen's reputation and Sinatra's. And he went into the restaurant part of the hotel where Cohen was having his breakfast. And he leaned over the table and told Carl Cohen that he wanted some money to gamble with. Carl, uh, Cohen refused to give it to him because Sinatra allegedly uh, picked up the edge of the table that Cohen, it was kind of a little booth. And he picked up the table and tipped it over in Carl Cohen's lap. 
and it uh, had bacon and eggs and coffee and so forth. And Cohen uh, was a little bit on, short on temper, and he got up and decked him and knocked his two front teeth out. I was a lieutenant at the time, a detective lieutenant. And uh, my partner and I went out to the hotel, and Sinatra had uh, got to the, went to McCarran Field and got in his private jet and flew out, and we weren't able to talk to him. Everybody was singing, all I want for Christmas is my two front teeth in town that year. I don't think too many people had a lot of sympathy for, for Frank Sinatra. Sinatra became very angered by the public embarrassment and everything else, and he stomped out of town and said he was never coming back. But he ultimately did. An FBI informant advised that it was indicated that this activity was planned in order to have Sinatra's contract at the Sands broken so that he could later be placed in Caesar's Palace, since this establishment had Cosa Nostra family interests. Informant did not believe this was planned, however, to the extent that Sinatra would lose two teeth. The Review Journal reported that singer Tony Bennett left his heart in San Francisco and Frank Sinatra left his teeth, at least two of them, in Las Vegas. Sinatra said, I built this hotel from a sand pile and I can tear the hotel down and before I'm through, that is what it will be again. The fracas ended a weekend of rampage by the singer. Sinatra drove a golf cart around the plush glamour spot, upsetting furniture and breaking a plate glass window. A few days later, Sinatra went into the casino at the Sands, apparently to apologize to the pit dealers regarding his actions. Jack and Trotter was angry the next morning that no one had awakened him. His Do Not Disturb sign was on for the night, but it didn't apply when Sinatra was in town. Yet it's doubtful even Sinatra's old friend and patron could have averted the disaster. KLAS-TV Channel 8 reported on September 12th that the Las Vegas Strip is still reverberating tonight with reports of Frank Sinatra's farewell at the Sands. He became abusive to employees and hurled a handful of chips at a Sands executive and dumped a glass of ice cubes and liquor on a crap table. Sinatra then reportedly went to his suite and attempted to call Sands Vice President Carl Cohen but was unable to reach him after which a singer allegedly tore the phone from the junction box and left for his home in Bel Air, California, saying he was through with the Sands. Howard Hughes would buy the CBS television station the following year. Caesars Palace announced that it has entered into a long-term contract with Frank Sinatra to perform at the plush $25 million hotel. Concurrently, Caesars Palace has acquired Cal Neva Lodge at Lake Tahoe from Sinatra Enterprises. The Caesars contract is for a three-year term. A statement from Sinatra read, I regret the termination of my long association with the Sands and have admired and respected Howard Hughes for many years and regret that my decision to accept the offer of Caesars Palace comes so soon after his acquisition of the Sands. Sands received phone calls and letters from all over the country about the Sinatra-Cohen fight. Dr. David Schwartz said in 2020, Pretty much everybody I have talked to, Benny Binion, Steve Wynn, anybody in the gaming business has said Carl Cohen was the best casino manager in the business. But when Cohen died, the Los Angeles Times opened with Carl Cohen, a veteran gambling executive who gained celebrity status for punching Frank Sinatra in 1967, has died at age 73. For nearly a decade, Frank Sinatra was the undisputed king of Las Vegas, and the Swinging Sands Hotel was the gaming palace wherein he reigned. As a drawing card, the King of Vegas could not be aced, and so, around the sands, Sinatra's word was law, until a little after 6 a.m. one day early last week. As it turned out, Sinatra had been negotiating with Caesars Palace for two months and had already signed up before the tiff with the sands. Sinatra's credit was cut off, sand sources said, precisely because he was running up sizable tabs just as he was leaving for Caesars. What's more, the Hughes-owned Sands suspected that Sinatra, in spite of his considerable wealth, must be relatively hard up for cash because he has been frantically trying to peddle his Cal Neva Lodge on Lake Tahoe to the Hughes' interests. Most Vegas observers agreed that Sinatra's Sands to Caesars Palace switch, topped off by his tantrum, was due to his festering chagrin over being eclipsed in Vegas by the new, inaccessible omnipotence of Howard Hughes. He was the Wizard of Oz. You never saw the man, and you never heard the man. You, you saw his minions, and you weren't even sure if they saw the man. And it was a very weird, weird deal. What you felt was his money. 
You're wondering, Sinatra cracked to one sans audience, why I don't have a drink in my hand. Hughes bought it. But privately, Sinatra found nothing funny about the Hughes takeover from his longtime pal Jack and Trotter, and he fumed when Hughes turned down the Calneva deal. The ignomatic recluse, in fact, would not even deign to return Sinatra's telephone calls. The joke making the rounds in Vegas was that when told of Sinatra's departure from the Sands, Hughes replied, Frank who? Kenny Epstein, the current owner of the El Cortez downtown, was the pit boss in the Baccarat section at Caesars Palace. Epstein explained that the Caesars owner said to me, Can you handle Sinatra? I said, Sure I can handle Sinatra. At least I thought I could. When he played, you had to go, Mr. S, does this play go? Is it showing? Playing? Because sometimes he would pretend like he was playing. Chips would be piling up and he would make a show. He wasn't gambling. Other times he would gamble. Early Sunday morning, September 6, 1970, Sinatra came in and he was playing. He was hard to handle and everyone wanted to stay away from him. I said, Mr. S, does this play? He said yes. He had an $8,000 limit at a $4,000 table since they doubled it for him. He was betting, playing, and then he lost $20,000 fast. They gave him another $20,000 and he plays. He loses $8,000. Now he's got $12,000. He bets $8,000 and he wins that bet. They pay him the $8,000 and he says, it all plays. I said, the limit is $8,000. He says, hey Boy Scout, take a walk. Everyone is laughing. But I said, it plays to the limit, $8,000. He deals the cards, and he wins again. The dealer, our dealer, pays him $16,000. I've lost all control of this game. I know this guy is a problem at the table, but I don't know what the hell to do. I go over to him and say, Mr. Sinatra, if you don't want to play by the rules, there is no game. I took the cards and threw them all over the table. Frank Sinatra was furious. He took the chips and threw them. Now these were $1,000 chips. Customers were picking them up. It was a madhouse. Sinatra says, get Wayne Newton to do the job. I quit. Who do you think you are? If I ever see you again, it will be the end of you. The Caesars owner said, listen, Kenny, take a week off and let us cool this thing out. It was just like his wild night at the Sands, a witness to the incident told the newspaper. The 54-year-old singer was playing cards about 5 a.m. Sunday morning when he began shouting. When the hotel's executive vice president, Sanford Waterman, began talking with them, they exchanged threats. Waterman ended the commotion by pointing a gun at Sinatra. Sinatra began a three-week engagement at Caesars Thursday night, but he did not show up for performances Sunday night. Waterman was booked Monday for investigation of assault with a deadly weapon and released without bail. District Attorney George Franklin said he also wants to talk to Sinatra. One remark he supposedly made to Waterman as he was going out the door was, the mob will take care of you. Sanford Waterman, 66, was accused of having drawn a 38 caliber pistol, but Sheriff Ralph Lamb indicated that Sinatra may have a few questions to answer too. If Sinatra comes back to town, said Lamb, he's coming downtown to get a work card, and if he gives me any trouble, he's going to jail. Entertainers are legally required to be fingerprinted and photographed and to be issued work cards by law enforcement agencies before accepting jobs in Clark County. Like most headliners, however, Sinatra has benefited from a gentleman's agreement exempting him. I'm tired of him intimidating waiters, waitresses, starting fires and throwing pies, Lamb continued. He gets away with too much. He's through picking on little people in this town. Why the owners of the hotels put up with that is what I plan to find out. A spokesman for Sinatra in Los Angeles said he knew nothing of any altercation or disagreement with any member of management at Caesars. He said Sinatra's failure to appear at the hotel Sunday night was because of exhaustion and pain in his right hand. The district attorney decided that no charges will be filed against Waterman, who reportedly pulled a gun on Sinatra. There were no law enforcement witnesses, no gun was picked up at the scene, and Sinatra flatly refuses to make any statement. Sinatra left town after the incident, and his spokesman has said it is unlikely he will work again on the Las Vegas Strip. Sinatra, in his first reply to allegations made against him, made a point-by-point -point denial of charges that he threatened Sanford Waterman and, according to some versions, seized him by the throat. The singer also denied a report that he told Waterman as he left that the mob will take care of you. He noted wryly that both District Attorney George Franklin and Sheriff Ralph Lamb, who were sharply critical of his reported role in the altercation, are running for re-election this year. 
I wasn't in the Baccarat game, Sinatra said. There was no such argument about credit or for how much I was going to play. As a matter of fact, I just sat down at a blackjack table, and I hadn't even placed a bet since the dealer was shuffling the cards. At that point, Waterman came over and said to the dealer, Don't deal to this man. I just got up and said, Put your name on the marquee and I'll come to see what kind of business you do. And I walked away. It was later, after I had gone to my room and just prior to my leaving the hotel, when I met Waterman in the lobby and he pulled the gun. As for his injuries, I never touched him. Sinatra was particularly upset by Lamb's charge that he had been intimidating waiters and waitresses. In what was meant to be an open letter to Sinatra, some 300 employees of Caesars assured the singer that we have never been intimidated or abused by you. On the contrary, you have been one of the most gracious, generous, concerned, and thoughtful of all the entertainers ever to work this hotel. The letter was not released to the press as originally intended because signers feared that they might lose their jobs. As for the remarks attributed to me relative to the mob, they're strictly out of a comic strip, he said. I don't make threats, and I'm not running for re-election. Caesars Palace co-founder Stanley Mallon said that he made a secret deal with Sinatra's attorney about gambling. So we had Sinatra at Caesars many times, and uh, he used to drink quite a bit, and he was a mean guy when he was drunk, and he used to belittle the, the dealers, and he used to force them into monies, and we didn't want him to gamble because he didn't want to pay when he lost, but he would badger the help. So we made an arrangement with his attorney that he would gamble, but we would settle up, tell him the next day, we wouldn't pay him, nor would he pay us. In other words, he really wasn't gambling. He thought he was gambling, but he really wasn't. He, he was tough to handle when he was drunk, and that was frequently. In a rare interview with press, Walter Cronkite asked Sinatra about his temper in 1965, two years before the fight at the Sands. Do you think your boiling point is low? Not anymore. It used to be. I think that comes with a normal growing up and the way of living with friends people with whom you become acquainted. I've always admired people who are gentle and who have great patience. I've had uh, people say to me in, in public places, uh, you're really a tough guy. And it's, uh, it was so far that I was, uh, in the beginning when I first started to get it, I thought, I was, I was really shocked. I thought, well, what started all of this thing? Trying to think to myself, what, what started all this thing? Sinatra has said that if the press reports world news as it reports him, we are all in trouble. But few people are ever represented to their own satisfaction by the people who write about them. For whatever truth or untruth lies beneath these headlines, it is probable that no one who has been exposed to the public as much as Frank Sinatra has is much different than the public thinks he is. His daughter, Nancy. Daddy loses his temper, it's headlines. The fact that he raises millions of dollars for underprivileged children all over the world by giving of his time and his own money, that doesn't rate headlines. But if he gets angry and has an argument with someone, headlines. So you figure it out. I don't understand it at all. We asked Sinatra if he didn't feel that he had a responsibility to his millions of fans. Uh, yes, I believe so. Bogart, when he was alive, once told me we were rather good friends through the years. And he said, the only thing you owe the public is a good performance. In other words, I love you.